All right, now I'm ready to start. I am Nikichi Taifa. I am the executive director of the Reparation Education Project, and my co-host Jessica Ann Mitchell Abuyor, who is the executive director of the National Black Cultural Information Trust. And on behalf of our two organizations, we welcome you to this next in the series of the Reparations Information Thought Series, a periodic strategic webinar featuring reparations experts, racial justice thought leaders, and you engaged in critical discussion, reflection, and analysis on issues pertinent to the movement for reparatory justice in the United States and abroad. So we are um, uh, really thrilled to have this particular uh, uh, episode of the thought series entitled New York exploring reparations in the Empire State. And I am just so really glad to announce that at the beginning of the year, the phenomenal bill was signed into law by the New York um, uh, governor, uh, establishing a task force, a commission to study the issue of reparations and develop proposals right in the backyard of the state. And we are very pleased to have some very esteemed uh, panelists uh, with us, legislator, commissioners, activists, ac advocates, and we're going to uh, uh, introduce them um, at this particular time. And Jessica, um, who we affectionately call Jam, um, if you could start in with the introduction of the first uh, person who is not here yet, but let's go on and, and give the Assemblywoman's um uh, bio at this time. Yes. Um, so who, she will be joining us in the next 20 minutes, hopefully. Um, this is Assemblywoman Mikael Solanges, a fifth term legislator. She is a lifelong resident of Elmont. Assemblywoman Solanges represents the communities of Valley Stream, North Valley Stream, Elmont, South Valley Stream, South Floral Park, Floral Park, the village of Bell Rose, Bell Rose Terrace, North Woodmire, Stewart Manor, and sections of Franklin Square. Mikhail was elected to represent the 22nd Assembly District in 2012 and is the first person of Haitian descent to be elected to the New York State Legislature. She currently serves as the Assembly Deputy majority leader, as well as chair of the New York State Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus. Through her work, she strives to ensure that all people are treated with dignity and protected equally under the law throughout New York State. Solange has continued to advocate for Nassau County middle class and small businesses by fighting for property tax relief, equitable state funding of schools, and increased public transportation on Long Island. Solanges is also nationally recognized as a leading advocate in improving access to quality child care, implementing a universal pre-K framework in Long Island, and establishing innovative ways to invest in families and young children across the age spectrum from birth to kindergarten, she resides in Elmont with her family and her dog. And again, we'll be graced with her presence in a, in a few minutes. So thank you so very much. I'm going to now uh, introduce Lurie Daniel Favors. She is an attorney. She is an activist. She is a fierce racial justice advocate. She's an author. She's a nonprofit leader. And she is a dynamo speaker. She is the executive director of the Center for Law and Social Justice at the Megar Evers College. She is the host of the Lurie Daniel Favors show on Sirius XM Radio, Urban View. Uh, she is a commissioner on the New York City Racial Justice Commission, as well as the commissioner on the New York State you all can correct me, I don't remember if it's commission or task force, the one that was just signed into law, but they'll let us know about that in a moment. Um, she uh, co-founded the Sankofa Community Empowerment uh, Incorporated, designed to educate and empower communities of African descent. And she later co-founded Breaking the Cycle Consulting Services, LLC. She is a contributing author to the birth of a nation, Nat Turner and the making of a movement. And she also penned Afro state of mind, memories of a nappy headed black girl, a coming of age story about a black girl fighting to find her place in the world where her hair texture and skin color did not fit the accepted beauty uh, standard. And last but not least, she uh, adheres to the West African principle of Sankofa and believes that 
one must use the past in order to understand the present and to build for a brighter future. Jam, introduce Dr. Daniels. Sure. Um, it is with great honor to introduce Dr. Ron Daniels veteran social and political activist. Dr. Daniels was an independent candidate for president of the United States in 1992. He served as executive director of the National Rainbow Coalition in 1987 and Southern Regional Coordinator and deputy campaign manager for the Jesse Jackson presidential campaign in 1988. He holds a BA in history from Youngstown State University, a MA in political science from the Rockefeller School of Public Affairs, in Albany, New York, and a Doctor of Philosophy and Africana Studies from the Union Institute of Univer and University in Cincinnati. Dr. Daniels is a distinguished lecturer emeritus at York College, City University of New York, where he taught courses in political science. From 1993 to 2005, Dr. Daniels served as first African-American executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights. During his tenure at CCR, he emerged as a major force fighting against police brutal brutality and misconduct, church burnings, hate crimes, voter, voter disenfranchisement, environmental racism, and the threats to civil liberties posed by the government's response to the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attack. In June of 1995, Dr. Daniels led an African-American fact-finding and support delegation slash mission to Haiti. As a result of the, of the visit, the Haiti Support Project was created to mobilize ongoing political and material support for the struggle for democracy and development in Haiti. HSP has emerged as the leading African-American organization working to build a constituency for Haiti in the United States. A prolific essayist and commentator, Dr. Daniel's comment, column, Vantage Point, appears in numerous Black and progressive newspapers and websites nationwide. He also hosts the weekly issue-oriented public affairs talk show, Vantage Point Radio, on 99.5 FM on Pacifica Network in New York. And until recently, he served as an occasional guest host for Make It Plain with Mark Thompson on Sirius XM Radio. Dr. Daniels is founder and president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, IBW, a progressive African-centered, action-oriented, resource-centered dedicated to empowering people of African descent and marginalized communities. As the administrator for the National African-American Reparations Commission, NARC, IBW has emerged as a leading organization within the United States and global reparations movements. NARC has devised a 10-point reparations program and is a staunch supporter of H.R. 40, the congressional bill that would establish a national commission to study reparations proposals for African-Americans. Dr. Daniels serves as the convener of NARC. And it gives me pleasure to introduce none other than my sister, Nicole Cardi. She, her, the executive director of Get Free. And if you have not heard about Get Free, Hold your horses, because they are about to take this movement over with a storm. In fact, Little Birdie told me upon information and belief, one of the primary reasons uh, uh, for that signing of the bill by the governor was as a result of the grassroots mobilization organized by the executive director of, of, of Get Free and her organization. It is a youth led movement focused on repairing past harms, removing ongoing barriers to equality, and realizing a future where freedom is for all. Nicole Cardi is a movement strategist. She is a digital organizer. Lord have mercy. I, mm, 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 mm. She is a digital organizer. See, Ron, you and y'all, you and me, we got, it's time. You know, these young folk, <laughs> they know how to press those buttons and make it work. And I've seen it in practice. Uh, she's a campaigner and a trainer born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, has over a decade of experience studying and supporting movements to further racial, gender, and economic justice. She is the founder and coordinator of Project Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations, and uh, she has led uh, trainings and has been a core team member of Momentum. Welcome, Nicole. And then last but totally and completely not least, we have 
a dear brother that I've just gotten to know really over the past couple of years, Antar Keith. Antar Keith was born to a working class family in Bronx, New York. He gained firsthand knowledge of political disenfranchisement in America with a from a family with strong ties to human rights advocacy. His father, William Bill Keith, was a poet, teacher, civil rights activist, black arts movement, avant-garde artist, ally of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Chappelle, founder of Harlem's Malcolm X Arts Foundation in 1977. Bill Keith was also a two-time victim of the prison industrial complex, unjustly incarcerated in New York's Almina Reformatory as a youth, and then again on Rikers Island shortly after Antar was born in 1985. As a result of his family circumstances, Antar's life trajectory, access to wealth, and chances for success were heavily pulled down. After studying English adolescence education at SUNY, he still found himself subject to the cycle of poverty and housing uh, insecurity. And simply put, he felt he could no longer breathe in America. And that's when Antar decided to move to Germany to pursue a master's degree in national and transnational studies at the University of Munster. And he now teaches English in the German federal uh, system. But his path to reparations advocacy came as a volunteer with Democrats abroad, the foreign arm of the U.S. Democratic Party. He serves as the chair of the state party's Global Reparations Task Force, which he founded in uh, 2001. And um, as part of when we get into the first questions, he can hopefully tell us, enlighten us a little bit more about Democrats uh, abroad and uh, the, the work that's going on with respect to that entity uh, in New York. So with that, actually, I'm going to just turn to the uh, first of all, welcome, panelists. How y'all doing? Uh, so I want to go and turn to the first question. Um, uh, and these questions are for all of you all to answer. And the way we're going to do this, we'll read the question and you all can uh, respond. We have several questions, about four of them. But then we're going to open it up to Q&A from our um, audience. And we invite the audience, you can start now if you wish, by putting your questions or comments in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, we don't have an interactive uh, chat, um, but if any of the panelists wish to share any information through the chat, it will go to everyone. So let's get started. Panelists, tell us just how you came to be a mover and shaker on the issue of reparations for the state of New York. And why do you believe, hopefully everyone does believe, but why do you believe New York owes reparations to Black people and or uh, communities. And uh, Jam, you call on who you want to call on to start. <laughs> sure. Let's start with Nicole. Why did I think, why did I know? I knew it was going to be. Hi, everyone. I'm really honored to be on this panel with all of my co-panelists. Really excited to get into it today. Um, well, I'll start with uh, the second part of that question, which is, why do you believe New York owes reparations to Black people and or communities? I would say I believe New York owes reparations to Black people because I believe New York has an interest in becoming a state where equality and freedom are real for all, actually. And we know that reparations, repairing the harm of white supremacy all the way back to its foundation is the only way that that's actually going to happen. So if you, the if New York, if the United States wants to actually be a multiracial state or country, this is the way to do it. Um, we really believe at Get Free that reparations are about the future. This is how we unleash a future where equality is real, people have what they need to thrive, and where we finally, finally have interrupted, stopped, ended the lies, harms of white supremacy and corrected and repaired the damage that they have done. Um, reparations correct the record on the past. Um, they are the ways that we move forward and tell our truths about who we have been and who we now get to be. I've been doing work in New York for the better part of a decade uh, um, and nationally for the better part of a decade. So I've been doing racial justice work for a while and um, reparations is really the upstream solution to so much of the housing criminalization work that I was doing. Um, and so when I 
got down to experimenting. I was like, you know, we actually need to stop doing whack-a-mole with these different issues and go upstream and fix it from the very root, which is why I and a few of my other comrades came together to build Get Free, which is a youth-led movement to really mainstream in the public and in politics um, reparations as the way that we make a future where equality is real and where a multiracial democracy is real. And so we are organizing a youth-led movement in order to uh, change the conversation, to make it really clear that this is something that our whole society, reparations for slavery, um, order our society to this day. They impact people, um, the black community, obviously those who are directly in lineage with those who are enslaved and other black people um, and everyone <laughs> um, to this day. They order our society for this day and we actually won't be free until we correct that damage that has been done. Um, so we began building out this grassroots movement. We launched Get Free in uh, June of last year. And our very first chapter was in New York, where I also live and have been working for a number of years. And we mobilized, as Nkichi was talking about, young people um, in coalition with Antar and a few others, really to put pressure on the governor to let her know that if she didn't sign this bill, we would be watching, we would know what it would indicate, and that we needed her to show leadership in this moment when we're seeing attacks on our history and Black studies all across the country. So we got out, we turned out young people, we turned and created pressure so that she wouldn't let this bill pocket veto on her desk. And at the end of last year, she signed this bill into existence. But the work has only just begun. And so we're going to be organizing people throughout um, to make sure that this bill and its recommendations of the commission actually are not just heard and heard and understood, but enacted into law. Um, and we're going to build a grassroots movement to actually make that a reality. So that's a bit about me and how I started getting moving and shaking in New York on the operation scene. And yeah, the work has only just begun. So excited to get into it with all of you and support this commission to be as successful as possible. Thank you. Um, love to hear from uh, Antar. Hi, Jim, and thank you. And thank you to Nikichi and thanks to the guests for being here. I really appreciate you champions being here. Um, so I'm just going to reiterate a little bit about what Nikichi already shared. Um, my name is Antar Keefe. I came to Germany in 2015 in order to obtain my master's degree um, as higher education is actually free in Germany. <laughs> and a year later, I joined uh, Democrats Abroad, um, the official state level Democratic Party, party arm for the millions of Americans living outside the United States. Democrats Abroad is a volunteer-run organization striving to provide Americans abroad a voice in the U.S. government and elect candidates by mobilizing the overseas vote and organizing them around issues affecting Americans internationally. Democrats Abroad, or DA, has members living in more than 190 countries around the globe who vote in every state and congressional district in the United States. After George Floyd's murder in 2020, our Global Reparations Task Force was democratically enacted in 2021 with a unanimous vote of party representatives across 52 country committees located throughout Europe, the Americas, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Despite passing two global party resolutions in support of a federal reparations commission and for a federal executive order for a federal commission and one democratic national committee resolution stateside to align the national democratic party to federal reparations advocacy. Our task force knew that New York would prove to be a unique battleground in the struggle for reparations nationally. And personally, as the son of a New York based civil rights advocate who associated with the likes of Malcolm and Dr. Betty Shabazz before his death in 2020, uh, 20, uh, 2004. Uh, uh, and my father also, you know, associated with um, the likes of Pete Seeger and Amiri Baraka, because they were also New Yorkers, especially Pete Seeger living up in Beacon, New York, where I was living. Um, my father was also, also unjustly incarcerated two times in New York, once as a youth during the Jim Crow era, when framed for murder, 
Uh, and again, while I was an infant, on when uh, uh, he was sent to Rikers Island on a false gun possession charge. Knowing that, I felt compelled to join this fight as it was personal to me. My story is not unique. I'm one of numerous survivors of the empire state policy of black deprivation, deprivation and disenfranchisement. And as someone who throughout his life had personally battled chronic resource insecurity, chronic poverty, chronic housing insecurity, even being evicted from my own house and thrown out onto the streets of upstate New York as a child to chronic underemployment as a young adult, I felt that the Empire State took something profound from my soul and from my existence. As a survivor of these structural harms, I feel I owe it to others, in particular those from communities like mine throughout the Bronx, to the Hudson Valley, to even our ancestors buried on Staten Island, to fight for recognition of our pain and uplift it to a global level. The desire to led me and my partner, Caitlin Kennedy, inspired by the powerful examples of Dries and Heath, Kenneth Henry, Cam Howard, Dr. Ron Daniels, and you too, Nikichi and Jam, to draft a joint letter of over 108 New York-based national and international groups to demand that Governor Hochul signed a New York State Reparations Commission bill in early 2023. I believe New York State's history, replete with massacres such as the New York draft riots, to pogroms such as the destruction of Seneca Village, to community eraser, erasure such as Robert Moses's wielding of city infrastructure to obliterate black communities, to the ma maintenance of racialized gulags such as Elmira Reformatory, Attica, and Rikers, to the deprivation of resources like in Buffalo, New York, which made it ripe for a targeted mass shooting, are signs of structural harm, which require change and redress at the structural level. That's what brings our task force to the fight for New York. And that's what brings me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antar. Um, Lori, we'd love to hear from you next. Could you actually repeat the question? I, there have been some really substantive discussion points raised. And every time someone spoke, it took my brain in a couple of different ways. I want to make sure I'm responsive to your question and not the excellence that was just laid out. Uh, so All if you right. could, it, That's the no problem. It really is. Tell us how you came to now being a mover and shaker on the issue of reparations for the state of New York. And why do you believe, if you do, New York owes reparations to Black people and or communities? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, yes, so I, I can start with the second one first. So New York State owes reparations because New York State has benefited from the enslavement and perpetual discrimination of African people. And, and I, I will be clear at the outset when I say African people or people of African descent, I'm speaking very broadly. Uh, I know that that is a, a, a question area that comes up frequently in discussions for reparations. Um, but uh, New York City or New York State rather at the height uh, was only rivaled it was only second to South Charleston, South Carolina, in terms of sheer numbers, what as it pertains to the amount of enslaved Africans that were here. There is virtually no point of New York state and or city uh, infrastructure, economic advancement, uh, political structure, housing policy, healthcare policy. There's virtually no element of how New York state currently functions that is not in some way rooted in the enslavement of African people. So um, yes, New York state absolutely owes reparations as does the nation, but we're, we're dealing with the state versus federal question here. And so we, we are limited to New York state. And so I answer firmly in the affirmative. Um, in terms of how I came to this space, I, I don't necessarily know that I consider myself a mover or shaker. Um, in any particular realm, I just happen to be a racial justice attorney who loves Black people and uh, who believes that we should all be using our power, influence, and expertise to advance the interests of people of African descent. Um, I, I did serve, as was mentioned, on the New York City Racial Justice Commission, which was the first uh, municipal effort to really grapple with how one corrects structural racism and, and the embodiment of white supremacist ideology and policy within our city charter, which is like our city constitution. 
that was a very instructive exercise and a really good opportunity at seeing how we are going to grapple with issues of racial justice in this state. Uh, my work at the Center for Law and Social Justice, which is the only racial justice law center charged with advocating on behalf of Black New Yorkers and the disenfranchised, um, is one that allows for my legal expertise and my uh, degrees in Black studies to come to sort of an intersection that uh, allows us to really advocate on behalf of Black New Yorkers in ways that are are unique simply because we are unapologetic in our approach and, and we live true to our mission. Um, I do wanna just make a quick note because I was seeing also some of the questions in the chat. And I just wanna point that when I speak about people of African descent, I started to say this at the beginning, um, I'm talking about a Pan-African look at we in New York state are unique in that we have, I think in the borough of Brooklyn, I heard this stat during the census campaign and I believe it said basically, uh, we have the largest congregation of Pan-African people anywhere on the planet outside of Brazil or the continent of Africa uh, because of the sheer numbers and the diversity of, of blackness that is present there. So questions and conversations about reparations in New York state are going to also allow us a really powerful opportunity to grapple with questions of lineage uh, that often come up to grapple with uh, questions of to whom is owed what and from whom. Uh, and so I am looking forward to being able to bring my expertise in this space. I, I wanna give a, a special nod to Antar. Uh, I was born and spent a significant portion of my life in Germany. Uh, so I'm always curious when I find black people who are moving to that space. I think my education there really helped to inform my view of how we address issues of race and racism here in these United States. So again, I don't know that I'm a mover or a shaker in any of these realms, but I do have a level of expertise that I think will be helpful, um, particularly as it is added to and supporting the brilliance of Dr. Ron Daniels and the other folks who will be a part of this commission. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to doing the work and making sure that we can represent the interests of our people to the best of our ability. So Larry, let me just say this, by the mere fact that you are a commissioner on the New York State Reparations Commission. You, you, whether you see yourself as a mover and shaker in reparations or not, I can assure you that the constituents around the state of New York are going to see you as such. And that was a great segue to Dr. Uh, Ron Daniels, who as the elder statesperson, shall we say, on this um, panel, come on and give us your perspective, how you became to be a mover and shaker uh, on the issue of reparations in New York. Why do you believe New York owes reparations? And hopefully uh, Assemblywoman will be here um, before we get through this, finish this question. If not, we'll just go on. Dr. Daniels, the floor is yours. And you are on mute. You need to get your digital fingers there and click that button or talk yeah. to Nicole Cardi next to you so she just, can tell you how to do it. I was just trying to be obedient. They say you should be on mute when you're not speaking. So I'm just trying to I'm trying to learn from all of y'all what I'm supposed to do. So as the elder states person, I just want to affirm that Lori Daniels' favor is a bad sister and a moving and shaker. So let's just get that out of the way. And I'm so uh, proud to be, you know, bathing in the brilliance of Antar and Sister Cardi, who I want to get to meet personally and so forth, because that's how I grow and develop. I mean, I think whenever you get to the point that you think you cannot learn, then that's a, that is stagnation and that's not particularly helpful. Let me quickly say that um, my introduction in terms of this work goes back to Queen Mother Oddly Moore, whom I think we should always uphold as well as the long legacy of people who have contributed. I was mentored by Queen Mother Moore. I, I owe a great deal to her because uh, she, um, said that she was a brain surgeon and that her mission was to operate on constipated minds. And as a master's student who thought I knew a little bit about everything, but did not know anything about reparations, I was one of her patients. And thank God I was, because she operated on my mind and that liberated me and freed me. So I always want to honor at least in my life, Queen Mother Oddly Moore. So I've been on working on reparations for, for a long, long time. I'm a lifetime member of INCOBRA. I respect the work that INCOBRA did for many, many years as the leading organization and still our legacy organization as it relates uh, to uh, reparations. Work with Congressman John Conyers, who was a major force for reparations. Um, you know, I worked with Nkichi and others. We were the ones who were coordinating the annual meetings at the Congressional Black Caucus and things along those lines. The my, I come to this work really by way of the National African American Reparations Commission. 
as quickly as uh, has a 10 point program that has been mentioned. Uh, we developed a 10 point uh, program as to, to be a sort of a frame of reference, you know, for the movement, uh, having brought together, you know, people who have been working uh, on this issue for many, many years. Uh, we also are staunch advocates for HR 40, uh, but also for state and local reparations. It was the National African American Reparations Commission that actually certified Evanston as a flexible, replicable model for reparations. And that is, you cannot underestimate the power of that because it meant that reparations is actually being done. Some people say it's too small. That's sort of beside the point. It's being done. Uh, and then in addition to that, we are now looking at reparations across the country, including places like California. And then we're also examining colleges and universities and institutions and all of that. I mean, that's a broad uh, purview. New York is critically important. I, you know, I'm so glad that New York, I mean, we were able to get it over the top because New York is the empire state. And one of the things that we know that has already been said was that empire was built on the extracted labor of African people going all the way back to its history. In fact, the point is that slavery and enslavement was not only down South, it was up South. And it's important not only for others to understand that this mission as is, is as important to people of African descent, to our own people as it is to others, because we ourselves sometimes don't know that history. Wall Street built on the capital of Black folk. But it also has been alluded, and this is very critically important, reparations is, is for enslavement, obviously. The, the Holocaust of enslavement, one of the greatest in, in human history, but it is also for all of the legacies of enslavement. I'm so glad that Antar mentioned uh, Robert Moses, right? He's held up as some kind of hero. With gentrification, disinvestment in Black communities, all of these are targeted racially exclusionary policies for which reparations are due. And there's much more that we will excavate as we go through. And then it is that educational process which will be, be beneficial in and of itself in terms of, 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 of learning ourselves as well as sharing with folk the nature of what reparations is, why reparations are, are due to African people uh, here in, in this state. Uh, I think that um, New York, because it is New York, you know, California led the way. We, we are obviously we will be learning from New York, uh, its experience. We're in a position to do that. We have people who can help us do that. But New York is New York. It is, it is, the, it is the financial capital of the Western world and largely the financial capital of the world. So it needs what we do in New York will be an instrumental uh, across the board. The other thing I want to say finally is, uh, and this was alluded to, I think, in, in Attorney Favor's comments, because people will say, oh, but, but reparations at the state level distract from the national level. And that's, that's just not true. We're talking about complementary efforts. In fact, the infrastructure that is we're now building out in cities and states across the country really lay the, lay, lay the groundwork for when H.R. 40 is passed and eventually it will pass. We will, we will get it across the finish line. It means the, the huge amount of federal resources resources that are required will come from the state level. I mean, I'm sorry, the federal level, but there'll be an infrastructure in place that can in fact be, uh, be uh, there to receive these uh, reparations. So I am delighted to be a part of this, uh, this task force and, 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 and hope that I also played some role in some of the moments that were necessary working with our dear sister Salaji and I, think I always got to remember and call out the name of Charles Barron, who uh, was instrumental in helping to move this forward. So there's a way in which sometimes we don't do that. I want to make sure to uphold him. But they picked up the torch. Uh, Senator Sanders helped to pick up the torch. So I was hopefully instrumental in working with them and, you know, having been around a while, sometimes, you know, your reputation with some of these elected officials and so forth helps out a little bit. So I'm glad to have been able to play some minor role in helping to get this over the top. So. That's my story. Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. Um, and we also want to welcome Assemblywoman Salages, who was able to join us. We did read her bio earlier. The question that everyone is answering right now is, 
tell us how you came to be a mover and shaker on the issue of reparations in the state of New York. And why do you believe New York owes reparations for black people and or communities? Well, first, um, it's an honor to be on this Zoom with so many different allies in the fight and who are going to really be able to, you know, bring the actualities of reparations to New York State. And um, I just happened to fall into reparations. As uh, Dr. Ron Daniels said, you know, I have to give homage to um, former Assembly Member Charles Barron, uh, who was my seatmate um, in the State Assembly. And I remember him, you know, trying to push this bill and talking about this bill because I, as a layperson, you know, heard about reparations and I heard about with like one facet of reparations. And, you know, with his education, I understood that it was it was more about just, you know, one facet of reparation. It was about healing our communities, bringing reconciliation to the wrongs that happen. And especially in New York State, where we talk we talk about the financial capital of the world, as it was said before, where we talk about New York State, the empire state, we that was all built on the backs of la of black labor. And then when we talk about the continued ills, uh, whether it's, you know, um, black code, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, redlining, you know, um, urban renewal, you know, we see over and over and over again that our communities are disenfranchised and there was never any atonement, never any opportunity for us to sit, to eat, to get something in return as a, as a means for us to heal our communities. And when we look at all the demographics, all the parameters when it comes to health care, when it comes to education, when it comes to financial success, Black New Yorkers are disenfranchised. So with that education I got from, from, from Mr. Barron, I was able to take the bill when he left the state assembly and organize a coalition under the Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus. And we discussed the bill and I really, again, thank Dr. Ron Daniels, Jams, you know, many of you on this call uh, who helped us get the bill to the finish line because it wasn't easy. Um, even our folks, our own folks, didn't believe that we deserve reparations. And so, you know, we were able to pass this legislation um, with the coalition and, um, you know, with the support of our leadership and be able to get it to the legislative finish line where we, we had to do more work <laughs> to work with the governor of New York to be able to get the support, to get the bill signed. And so, you know, this work has been hard work, um, a lot of capital spent, um, but it's for a good reason because we're paying homage to our ancestors. Uh, we're thanking them, our elders, we're thanking them um, for the unpaid labor, the pain, the suffering they went to, and now building up the next generation and our future so that we can grow and that we can create a world that is is that gives equality and justice for all which you know i pledge allegiance to the flag every day you know as as a legislator you know i stand in that chamber i put my hand on my heart and i do believe that everyone in this world deserves equal access to justice and opportunity but we have to make that happen and us as a new yorkers we have to ensure that it goes forth so you know like was said before there are a lot of challenges we're learning a lot of lessons from other states and localities that have implemented reparations and you know it it, it it's really just been a pleasure to be in this space and although i'm new to it i do pay homage to all those who come before me so thank you so very much, Assembly uh, Woman. And we have um, uh, two more questions that Jam and I are going to share because we want to have opportunity to hear from uh, you to respond to some of the Q and A uh, from the chat. So we're going to ask for our, our answers, responses to be a little bit more uh, concise. Um, and I'm I'm going to just ask the two questions that we have. The first is: Do you anticipate any misconceptions and hurdles? toward getting reparations passed in the state of New York? And if so, how do you plan to overcome them? Hurdles or misconceptions, who wants to start? I, I can take a stab at this. All right, <laughs> go on attorney favor. So some of the, the commentary that I've seen at, at a variety of panels and workshops, it seems to indicate that there might be a need for clarity on who we are talking about 
and from which pool we would be looking uh, when it comes to evaluating who gets reparations. I was I was at an event where there were some folks who were um, very concerned that perhaps people whose ancestries whose ancestors had been enslaved in another nation would be able to secure rep reparations through New York State. And then on further inquiry, I, I learned through the conversation that the person who was very vigorously opposed to a non-American ancestral enslavement lineage getting access to New York State reparations, I then learned that their family had been a part of the Great Migration. And they themselves did not have family that had been enslaved in the state of New York. And it was kind of interesting to sort of see the wheels turn in their head when we began talking about, well, if this is a New York State Reparations Commission, and, and I just want to be clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of the commission in this capacity, in this panel, I'm speaking on my own individual capacity. Um, but it was just interesting to see them have to take a pause when I pointed out to them, well, that based on that logic, that also meant that they would not be eligible for reparations uh, from the state of New York if their family had not actually been enslaved in the state of New York. And that gave them a lot of pause because I don't think they had thought through how some of the complications would be addressed. And, and so it was important for them in that moment to know that as I understand it and my intention um, with my role in the commission would be to make sure that we are educating people and that people are clear about what the legislation contemplates. Be clear about the fact that there is a contemplation for those who were enslaved and those who suffered the brutalities of, of continuing racial discrimination after enslavement. So I think because of the way that we've, Sometimes it's, it's good to not be first out of the gate so that you can see how other people have had to grapple with some of these questions and grapple with these issues. And it's going to be important, I think, that we have a lot of education and a lot of, and I mean real education, because a lot of people are coming to the reparations conversation. And when Dr. Ron Daniels said Queen Mother Moore, I'm sure there are some people, maybe not in this audience, but there will be a number of folks in our community who have never heard that name before, Absolutely. who are not familiar with INCOBRA, who don't understand John Conyers' role in this conversation, and but are very much connected to this issue um, personally, emotionally, and ancestrally. And so I, I think there's going to have to be a lot of time spent on education and making sure that people are clear about what the legislation speaks to because the reparations commission will have to operate within the confines of that legislation. Um, and and I, so I think that that's something that I've already seen and, and know it's something that has been a point of concern for me, even when we were fighting for the legislation to be passed, making sure that there is an educational component that explains what it is exactly that the legislation covers and how this particular reparations commission can be used to provide a path forward, even if we don't necessarily um, take the final step in, in terms of, you know, some people are very upset that the state of California ended without people actually getting access to their reparations. That also speaks to a lack of understanding as to how government functions and works. And all of that are going to be stumbling blocks that we are going to have to, and I'm not just talking we the commissioners, I mean we the community who want reparations to be a fight that advances as opposed to one that people just are able to cut off at the knees. It's going to be really important that we invest in the education of our community um, in culturally responsive ways that will allow them to more fully and meaningfully participate in the process. Process. That's certainly one thing that I've seen this far. So let me just say this, because I think that that was a very comprehensive um, answer. And no one was expecting anyone to have 100% answers for all this. This is a thought uh, series. But unless someone else is just burning to add to what Attorney Favors has said, I'd like to go to the next question so that we can uh, be able to have our interaction uh, with a very robust uh, Q&A. <laughs> that is it. So it, it, unless someone's burning, I'd like to just go on to next, the, the last question that we're going to raise to the group and whoever wants to respond or not respond or, or whatever. Is that, a, do I have consensus here? Okay. So now again, this last question I'm asking, again, no one, I don't even know the answer to it. Okay, so I'm still thinking my thoughts out on it. So no one is expecting, even at the pre-commission stage in New York State, for you have definitive answer, but you might have some views with respect to it. And that's what we're, we're trying to generate here. So the question is, do you see a difference between reparations and basic public policy? And if so, what do you see as that difference? I mean, Nicole talked about... Uh, uh, 
uh, reparations being the upstream um, answer, but that's upstream dealing with policies and public law. So when we go there and we deal with housing and we deal with education, upstream as opposed to downstream, what is the difference? Or is there or should there be between reparations and basic public policy that should be occurring anyway by government to everyone? Anybody? Okay, Anton Keith, straight from Germany, talk to us. Hi, Nikichi, thank you. Yeah, um, I see a big difference. Um, I believe we should, you know, understand that there is a distinction to be made between reparative policies and, you know, a generalized social equity policy. Um, reparative measures can and ideally should, in my opinion, you know, work alongside individual social equity programs but they shouldn't be um, put as a zero sum one or the other. They need to work and interact with each other. And we need to know that there's a difference between the two. We need to understand that reparations is more than just racial equity policy. We need to understand that black Americans, both descendant communities, as well as those of more recent immigration background are victims of gross human rights violations as evidenced by objective, non-vested international bodies such as the United Nations. The harms we've experienced were not equal um, like, for instance, th those who are suffering, you know, economically, but not with any kind of legacy of anti-Black policy and those who are, the harms we've experienced are not equal. So any solution that does not recognize um, this distinction is not actually a solution, but an illusion to mask our unique suffering as Black Americans. Victims of gross human rights violations, such as Black Americans in New York, need and deserve more than social equity or a one tide lifts all boats mentality, because as we know, not all boats were treated the same, and some boats have been scuttled repeatedly for over 400 years. Victims of gross human rights violations like us need the present policies harming them acknowledged and removed, while having the accumulated intergenerational damage leveled against us through successive generations of racist policy reversed completely. Now, this is very different from social equity, which is just one tide lifts all boats, treating everybody in an almost colorblind fashion. Social equity programs can never and should never, in my opinion, replace the moral and legal obligation of the perpetrator of harm, that is, the state government of New York, to, prevent, to provide repair and restitution to the aggrieved victims of its harm, that is, targeted Black communities and their descendants, for unjust anti-Black laws. And again, this applies to both those with recent migration history and those who have a lineage, so to speak. We're all victims of these anti-Black policies that are attacking us to this day, right at this very moment. This is the difference, in my opinion, between reparations of public equity and why our policies need to be targeted to our harmed group, our collective harmed group, and our collective unique harm areas. And that is also why we need robust grassroots engagement and input throughout the state to really un understand the extent of what our harms are and what we need to do to repair them. That's what I believe. Thank you. Ooh, again, another quite comprehensive um, answer. Um, I don't know if we want to go to the Q&A um, box or is someone just itching uh, to get in, let me know right now before I turn it over to Jam to go over some of these questions. Like, Dr. Darius, I see you getting closer to the mic. I mean, I don't know. No, no, I yield on that, really. I mean, I, I deliberately, you know, you know, I have an answer on that. But I mean, <laughs> but but I also want to hear others first. So I, and I think that getting to the honest is more important than me speaking at this point. OK, OK. OK, so Jam, what do we um Sure, I have a list. Oh. <laughs> Let's keep going, because, uh, Lord, I know we're not, I'm sorry to everyone, we're definitely not going to be able to answer all of the questions. We um, do go to 2.15. I want to make folks know this is 1 o'clock to 2.15 Eastern time. Yeah. Yes, and um, some of them were already answered through the course of speaking, so if you don't answer it uh, right now, it's either because of time or because it's already been addressed. I wanted to go to this uh, first question from Ronnie Galvin. Um, he says, greetings, family. What insights do you have about the prospects and impacts of Black people getting reparations in the context of racial capitalism? So I thought that was an interesting question. Is anyone 
that would like to tackle that first? Should I call on names? Well, I'm going Holly. I'm I'm gonna answer that because I I've been well. I'm I'm, I'm glad to hear from Brother Ronnie Galvin. I know who he is and so forth. So, uh, and that is a particular interest that he has in terms of the question of racialized capitalism because what it what it it, it raises the question of whether or not at the end of the day um, repair is possible. And I think. Uh, the definitive answer to that is, and some people have already alluded to it, uh, at the end of the day, um, and I think um, uh, Nicole was in there, Nicole mentioned this as well, it is really reparations, and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has said this as well, that gets at the heart of structural institutional racism and or racialized capitalism. Which means that as we press forward, it, it it actually strains the system and exposes the system in a way that really will precipitate a broader conversation about how to create a more just and equal society. Um, and so I think that's important to keep raising that question for that reason and to see that rep this this movement really is is historic in all those ways. It is Professor Hillary Beckles, for example, has said he is the the chairperson of the um, uh, Paracom Reparations Commission, he has said that reparations will be the human rights issue of the 21st century. And I think he's right, because not only are we going to be cleansing the, the, the infection of, of, of racism and white supremacy in the United States, it's going to be happening all over the globe. And by the way, there are going to be other people joining with us in that pursuit because they have also been affected so I think the answer to that is yes, uh, that it is possible. And at the end of the day, uh, you mean it may not be in my lifetime, but at the end of the day, this this is a noble pursuit and, and, and it can be fulfilled. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. Would anyone else like to uh, tackle this question? And if not, we can move on. But Nicole, I didn't want to talk. Or assembly woman? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, when we were fighting to get the bill signed, and I think McKinsey and Nicole and Get Free for all their advocacy um, on the on the issue, you know, we went out there, we we're talking to average New Yorkers. And I think, you know, the more we talk about represent, represent, sorry, me, reparations, the more we socialize the idea, the more that we get allies to help us. And then when it comes to the point where government has to react and the government has to to you know fulfill their their commitment, we are we are in a better position. So the more that we educate the people around us and socialize the idea, the better we are going to be when we actually have to you know present an idea before the legislature and vote on it. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Anyone else? I can just quickly add that. Um, I definitely fully agree with everything that's been said, Dr. Ron Daniels and by the Congresswoman. I feel like the one addition I would say is our ability to win things is in this country pretty related to our ability to organize people to advocate for things. And so as we're having these conversations about um, racial capitalism, which has impacted everyone in this country, most specifically Black people, um, we're creating an opportunity to have clarity around what we all have to gain from dismantling these systems. And if we can organize people into seeing that, understanding that, then we'll be able to generate the political will to really get these reparations policies entrenched into law. So that's part of um, the value and the place of where organizing comes in here. We've only ever gotten transformational change in this country through mobilizing people. And so we're gonna need to do that as part of this effort too. But all the same, I think there's a very high chance we can do it. I believe in our ability to do that work. And I think this is the conversation that's really at the heart of this country. Um, and it's one that the country is ready for. Thank you. So I'm going to go on to the next question, unless anyone else wants to answer that one. Well, um, let's keep, going. keep it going. Okay. Um, Niamo Mood. I uh, asked, how do you think the dismantling of affirmative action and DEI can actually propel the reparations quest? My belief is that it can. Any thoughts on this? So I I hopped in and answered this and I was really excited to see this question because um, I agree that it really can. I think that actually right now in this country, we are in a question between if we're gonna maintain white supremacy and 
and whiteness as a organizing structure of our society, or if we're going to make reparations to actually create a society that has equality. And so these fights over DEI that are basically trying to make any policy to that advances equality illegal, both really demonstrates and magnifies the effort that is trying to entrench white supremacy for good in this country and forces us to have a conversation around what actually is going to make this country equal and do we want to move in that direction. And so it puts reparations um, back in the conversation. It actually takes away a conversations about diversity and, you know, not exactly about repairing and redressing harms that have been done by this government puts that diversity conversation to the side and has a much more direct conversation around, are we going to undo the infrastructure that has exploited, um, dehumanized, um, robbed our communities actually, or are we not? And brings that more into the public conversation. So what I've been telling people is we're actually in a national reparations conversation right now. Um, and the question is what we're going to do about it as a society. So I'm curious. I, I so appreciate your response, Nicole. I actually see it a little differently. Um, so now I, I'm going to have to send you an invitation. We got to go to lunch because I want to hear more because you 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 gave me optimism in, the, in that response. Um, I, I actually, if I understand the question correctly, I, I actually see it more of, of a challenge than an opportunity. Well, I mean, all challenges are opportunities, but the idea that we now have... Um, uh, political parties, judges, a legal framework that essentially says the only type of racism that is worth, that is considered actionable is racism as against white people. Um, the idea that we can't have, we can't even learn about in many states what the causes that, what the issues that need to be repaired are because we can't actually have honest conversation or teach truth about American history, um, can't teach truth about slavery in this country. I actually see it as, as creating further stumbling blocks. Um, but so that's why I said we got to do lunch because I need more of this optimism because I'm sure there's a way to view the issue that I'm not seeing. Um, but we're in a moment right now where um, the 14th Amendment is essentially being reinterpreted as protecting white people from racism, which again is a concept that I still struggle to, to deal with, but it's this notion that uh, we can't, we have to have a colorblind society. And if racism or, or slavery was rooted in a racial justification, then to me that, that actually gives fodder to people who are trying to prevent reparations in some ways that I think we are going to have to grapple with how to deal how to deal with it really effectively. Um, we, we're at the Center for Law and Social Justice, for example, and we are a racial justice law center. It is not hard for me to imagine how the efforts to prevent us having conversations about affirmative action, dismantling integration and, and the legal policies that uphold it, including the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, Act the, the Civil Rights Act, which is definitely, in my perspective, next. I, I am struggling to see how eradicating uh, the legal framework that upholds integration, how eradicating our ability to have open and honest dialogue about the implications of white Christian nationalism, about the reality of enslavement, about the reality of racial inequity in this country. For me, I see that as something that leads more towards a, a hurdle that we will have to figure out how to navigate um, so I, I love that, Nicole, that you you see some hope and optimism here. Uh, I, I do, unfortunately, until we had his lunch, uh, I see it a little bit differently. I, I think it, it's going to create an even more complicated path, uh, path forward, not to say that it's insurmountable, but certainly I, I think it creates questions um, that we're definitely going to have to grapple with. Can I jump in quickly, really quickly here, because this is really exciting in some ways. Um, first of all, it means that... Uh, and, and Roland Martin talks about this uh, a great deal, the importance of political education and civic education in our community becomes enormously important. She was, because there's a relationship between jurisprudence and the whole question of what we're dealing with. Because what has happened with the conservative thrust, and they knew what they were doing, they, 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 plan, they had a plan to create a Supreme Court that would eradicate the whole question of race as a racial remedy. So diversity, a lot of this stuff is just like, even with the with the Michigan decision and all that, they were saying, well, diversity, I mean, they, would, they, they attacked the question of racial remedies. 
which means that the whole notion of the Supreme Court, its decisions are not platonic. In other words, they're not static. They are subject to the will of uh, at the interpretation of the generations and what people think and, and, and social and political movements. But the point I want to raise, which I, and I was really uh, excited about Judge Katanji Brown, because she was raising this question. We do new, have to have a conversation about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. I came up on Arthur Canoy at Center for Constitutional Rights. And there's a piece he wrote called The Constitutional Right to Negro Freedom, I think it was entitled. And he argues persuasively 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were dedicated to the eradication and eliminating the badges and indicity of the slavery for African people, people of African descent. doesn't mean it can't be more broadly applied, but to apply it differently is really a subversion. But that's a part of the educational process, Nicole, that you've been talking about and this commission will take up. Because we need to be more on the offensive around those ideas because some people, you know, you, you take so many blows until sometimes you forget. But this that point about the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments has got to be re-injected re into the conversation in terms of what the original intent of them were. And then we have to back it by how we march on ballot boxes. And in some ways, we have got to be able to say, I know this, we have to be almost singularly focused on being able to do what they did in terms of transforming that judicial system, because by doing that, they essentially did Plessy versus Ferguson all over again. They reinstituted the ability to have judicial sanction on their white supremacist ideas. Any other thoughts on this? Okay, so... Um... This is from Leon Dixon. Can someone speak on the need for internal reparation? I think this comes up in almost every conversation that we have, but if anybody wants to address it um, or tackle it, let me know. Let me just say something about it, if I may, because I know it's come up. Um, I think we might need to have a thought series on that because um, a lot of people don't know what is meant by internal uh, reparations. I personally, this is just me, myself personally, don't like the, that concept. I, I understand the internal repair. I just don't like calling it reparation. But again, maybe I have not been educated enough on the proponents of that term. And a lot of it comes from in COBRA, uh, you know, as well, National Coalition Black Reparations in America. So while we need internal healing and inter internal uh, repair, um, we might want to do like a thought series on that and bring forth the um, um, advocates who have really been advocating that. So I think we should just go on and move on until we have the experts on who um, are, are lifting up that concept and, and can educate us all on that. And we can agree. We can disagree. We can agree to disagree. Or we can agree to agree. But um, we'll, we'll have a, a forum for that. OK, great. Thank you. I think a lot of people would be interested in that. Um, so we have a question directly for Nicole um, from Catherine Richardson. Does your org focus on strategizing for national legislation for reparations? Um, what would be your ground game on doing that? Uh, great question. Thank you. So, yeah, we are organizing young people all across the country in order to uh, advance reparations nationally. We've been on a training tour all across the country to really make clear to young people what reparations have to do with creating freedom and equality, what they have to do with upending white supremacy. And um, right now, in addition to our work in New York, we're hoping to map this conversation onto the election next year. And so we're gonna be planning mobilizations to organize young people to really create a choice point between re-entrenching white supremacy, which is what is which is the agenda that is moving to end these DEI, to rewrite our um, 14th Amendment. You know, this is part of a campaign that is not a new campaign. This campaign showed up after we did desegregation. This campaign showed up after we did reconstruction, right? This campaign justified white rule and created white supremacist architecture. This is like the, the movement that is here now and has been here the whole time that really relies on these structures of racial supremacy in order to hold on to power. And so we're trying to do campaigns to reveal that that is what the stakes are 
and also to push politicians into doing the opposite of that, which is dismantling white supremacy, passing reparations, actually addressing this at the root, having a real conversation about what the future of this country is and where repair fits in on that, because you cannot have a multiracial democracy, you cannot have equality without reparations. And so that is part of the conversation we're advancing nationally and we're organizing young people around this year. And our goal is to really make that choice point clear and then to harness um, political capacity and energy to making reparations a public and political priority so we begin to get national legislation um, in the years to come. That's a short version of our overall strategy. But uh, just want to like repeat and speak to what I heard from Dr. Daniels and uh, Lori, Attorney Lori, because that's exactly what is going on. I completely agree and see all of these challenges for what they are, but they reveal a truth underneath them that allows us to have a conversation um, that can get us close to reparations because hopefully our country doesn't want to choose white supremacy, it wants to choose equality. And when we begin to have the conversation in that term, then it gets a lot more people close to reparations than they currently are. So that's a little bit about our work. And uh, you can follow us at getfreetogether.org. I'm sure Nkichi will send around a follow-up email with, with more on that. Louis, I think you wanted to hop in to clarify a, a point that was previously made. Yes. So, and this is a real good uh, example as to what I was speaking about earlier when it comes to rep to education. So there was, there's sort of a, one of the themes in the questions are that, uh, and I'll read from one in particular, um, to not include New Yorkers who are descendants of slavery in the U.S. South as persons who are eligible for reparations from New York State is wrong and shows a poor understanding of history. And, and I wanted to speak to this, and the question goes on uh, to talk about the ways that New York was complicit in Southern enslavement. And I think those are all valid points. But I, I wanted to highlight this point because it speaks to the need for the limitations of what the New York State Reparations Commission is going to be able to grapple with. And so I, I know I can't share the screen, but I just, if you go to the language of the bill, and this is an important point, because this is going to be the baseline education point that we're going to have to be able to move forward. Uh, it establishes the commission. I'm looking at section three, subpart A, and subpart B says duties. The commission of shall perform the following duties. Examine the institution of slavery, which existed within the state of New York and in the city of New York. The commission's examination shall include, but not be limited to, an examination of the capture and procurement of Africans, the transport of Africans to what is now known as New York City and New York State, the sale and acquisition of Africans as chattel slavery within New York. So it goes on and on and on and on and on. We all here can, I think, agree that reparations is something that is owed to all people who were enslaved in the United States of America. Of America. But the New York State Reparations Commission is looking at when it comes to the enslavement period. It's not looking at enslavement that happened to everybody that also had some sort of nexus to New York. It's looking at who was enslaved. When it comes to the limitations on the enslavement question, it's looking at who was enslaved within the state of New York. So, and this was really to the question, I the point I made earlier about the example, if you are someone whose family was enslaved in Georgia and you then migrated to New York state under the terms of the legislation, which binds the commission, then New York state is also able to examine in subpart E, the treatment of formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants in the city and state of New York during the period between the end of the Civil War and the present. So a person whose family was enslaved in Georgia, who then came to New York State, and they were not enslaved in New York State, according to the commission and the language that guides the commission, they would be able to be considered for what their family experienced between the end of the Civil War, moving to the present. That family would not be considered in terms of reparations for the enslavement portion because they were not enslaved within the state of New York. I highlight that because it's so important that we, one, that political education, that civic education, understanding how the nuts and bolts are put together is going to be so important. And it is not to say that the enslavement of all African people who wherever they were enslaved throughout the nation is not valid. It's to say that because this is a state reparations commission, that when it comes to the enslavement era, that's looking at people who were enslaved here. Now, there is also this subsequent bucket that says people who came to the United to, to New York State after the end of the Civil War until present. But do you hear the language there? 
If you came to the state of New York after the Civil War till present, and I'll give it to you specifically, during the period, the treatment of formerly enslaved Africans, doesn't say where you had to be enslaved, the treatment of formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants in the city of New York and the state of New York during the period between the end of the Civil War and the present, that would also include Black people who came here from the Caribbean. That would also include, because we're not talking about, we're talking about the enslavement era and the post-enslavement era. So I know that there is a lot of uh, uh, ideology. There's a lot of very firmly, powerfully, and closely held beliefs about who is entitled to what for whom. I get that. I understand it. But we are going to be limited within this state to the confines of what that legislation lays out. And that is going to require us to make sure our community knows and understands it. I'm not trying to do no okie doke. Sister Nikita, you know, I am not trying to be one of them folks who pull out the rug from under. We don't do okie doke, all right? We trying to uplift community. I mean, ain't nobody getting paid for this, right? This ain't something that we, you know, pocketing money on the side. Ain't nothing like that. So I just want us to be clear that uh, there's a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, righteous, right? And no judgment on the emotions, but we need our emotions to be educated and to be informed. And I think it's gonna be really important that community leaders, organizational leaders do the work of making sure we say, this is the limitations of this particular body. There are other things we can advocate for. We also have to yet advocate for the federal level. There is much more work to be done. I just wanted to point that out because that line of inquiry and, and lack of clarity, I think has Help to frustrate a lot of people who are trying to move reparations forward in a variety of ways. I just wanted to provide that, and hopefully that will that will be instructive to people as they figure out how they want to engage in the topic going forward. I just want to, um, can I jump a bit? Wait, hold on once, just one second. I'm gonna let you just one second. I just want to say thank you so very much for that. We are at time, but what we're going to do is we want to allow each of the panelists to give one final statement, not just just one final, because I think Larry, you kind of. Hit that on the, the, the nail. We had nearly 100 participants on this call. The video will be available. We really want to thank you all for taking your time to join us. And we're going to allow our, our if we could just stay just a few minutes um, longer, allow our participants to just give one um, very brief um, closing statement. Dr. Downey, you got the floor first. Yeah, I just want to, uh, to just add a, uh, an additional thought to what uh, um, uh, Attorney Lori Daniel Favis just outlined, and that is, uh, the importance of comprehensive reparations as we articulated within the National African American Reparations Commission. Because at one level, we also don't want to leave anything on the table. I mean, I, I want people to think about that. Why would we leave anything on the table in terms of our people? I mean, I'm not interested in just me, myself, and I. I want to make sure that all of the injuries that were, that were incurred, that they are repaired. It's not about me. If I don't get none, that's okay. But I want to make sure all the injuries, both in terms of enslavement and all of the legacies, people whose communities were destroyed because of the policies of Robert, whatever his name is, I'm forgetting right now. All of that needs to be on the table. That's it. All right. Thank you. Who's next? Closing statement. I just want to say thank you all. You know, I, the work of the legislature right now is on pause and we, you know, look to the commission to to help facilitate this work. But already I'm just proud of um, all the people on the Zoom for just, you know, bringing this conversation forward. And really, it's just an honor to be with you all. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Who's next? next? Yeah, I, I just have to jump off on that and say it's a real honor to be with you all today. Thank you for convening us in Kichi and I feel like coming out of this call, I have so much confidence in uh, the commission itself and the work that we're gonna be moving on the outside to support it and know we'll be in contact and looking forward to building from here. So thank you so much. Antar? Yes, um, as someone who lives abroad, it's clear that New York's Reparations Commission is not only consequential to the national narrative of the need for reparative justice, but in you know my opinion, it's also critical to the international dimension as well. The wealth um, that you know uh, Dr. Downs has already articulated that New York's financial industry generated off of the accumulated capital of stone labor powered markets across the pond here in Europe, but really all across the world, funded military adventurism abroad, and in large part posited the city's financial system as a cornerstone of the U.S.-based international order from 
World War II until present. Well, you know, the concept that we know of the international order, where we're living in a unipolar, unir, unipolar um, uh, uh, a superpower world. What I really want to say is this. Um, as an American living in Germany, reparations is not some kind of rarefied, non-concrete, abstract concept. It's a concept geared to and anchored by international law. It's geared to and anchored by international standards. There is no kind of subjective kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it exists somewhere in this way, you know, and in another way, it's, it's always anchored by law, by some external body, some corpus that can be conferred to and referred to. And this is how it is in the world outside of America. What we're seeing now in New York is a concretization of reparations at the local, state, and ultimately the federal level. And it's important that we reconcile with this idea that reparations is going to be concrete and the New York State Reparations Commission is a critical part of that puzzle. In Germany, my taxes go towards the reparations that this country has to pay for the atrocities mm, that committed in the past. You know, I'm a black man and I'm paying literally mm. reparations. So for people in America who say, well, I didn't, my family didn't, no, that it's it's a debt owed by a government that profited in such a way off the backs of other people that it compelled you to come to that country to make money. So in this way, many Americans already understand reparations. Americans resident in Germany who live and pay taxes, they already pay reparations. They understand it. If it's possible for us here, it's possible for us in New York, and it's possible for us nationally. And this is the beginning of that mission. Thank okay. you. And I really Ashe. enjoyed it. Thank you. Ashe, thank you very much. Lori, real quick, real quick, final word. No, I, I'm good, sis. I appreciate the opportunity to build. Dr. Ron Daniels, I sent you a message in the chat. Don't be mad at me, my elder. <laughs> There's a lot going on. But I really appreciate this time. I'm looking forward to, to collaborating with my fellow commissioners and all the folks who are serious about getting justice for our people. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for joining us for another session of the Reparation Information Thought Series. As usual, we could not get to all of the questions. If y'all could see, it's almost 100 questions in the Q&A. Completely not possible, but we tried. And what we can do, we have tried to save some of the questions that were asked in the chat so they can be considered for future future thought sessions. Um, and uh, just send me an email also at info at nbcit.org if you have any other pressing questions that we could possibly make a, a specific conversation that can be discussed in a whole. But I just wanna say thank you to all of you movers and shakers in New York um, leading the way on the East Coast. We are so excited to see the work of the new commission and the organizations that are fighting to make this work happen on the state and federal level. So thank you to everyone and have a great Tuesday.